going on in the world right now, a lot of, a lot of the ugliness that's going on in the world. Um, one of the things I did in the Army, for a long time I worked with Special Forces. Uh, those guys, um, actually it's one of their mottos, hearts and minds. And one of their jobs is to go out and if we go into a combat situation to deal with the people that might be allies or might, might be someone that, that uh, we are supporting and deal with them on a one-to-one -one basis and help them get through the, the situation that's going on in their country. Um, and today we're going to talk a little bit about spiritual warfare and the things that are going on. So uh, let's just go to the Lord and pray prayer as we start here. Father God, I thank you so much that you brought us together here to worship you and praise you, Lord. I thank you that we can come to you with our, with our prayers, with our needs. And we know, Lord, that you're listening. And we know that we serve a risen Savior, Father. As we go into this sermon, Lord, just give me the words that you want spoken. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the first thing I want to bring up here is there's a difference between a battle and a war. Wars can last for years and years and years. The longest war we ever had was the war in Afghanistan that lasted 20 years. But wars can last a long time. I think about, you know, the, the current situation. We try not to deploy anybody in the military for over a year. One year, and then they get to come home for a while. But I think back like in World War II, and some of those guys spent four years and never came home. They were four years in the battlefield. But when you talk about wars, you've got generals sitting in offices making decisions and all these other things going on, but a battle is different. If you're in a battle, that means you're one-on-one. -on -one. It's you and whatever you're dealing with. That's what a battle is. And the war that we're going to talk about today is spiritual warfare. And that's been going on since the very beginning of time. And it will end when Jesus returns. But individually, we're going through a battle ourselves every single day. Each of us are in a battle right now. Whether you want to admit it or not, whether you recognize it or not, we're going to talk a little bit about that. But we are all in a battle right now. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16-17 says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet, sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. That's the end. We know the end. We know how this is going to turn out. We know the end of the story. We have a lot of things in the Bible that lead to that, including the entire book of Revelation, explaining how it's going to end. But the end is not here yet. And we are fighting until the end. We are called to fight until the very end. Until Jesus returns, we're supposed to hold firm. We're supposed to be carrying his banner. We're supposed to be fighting for him. So our, our focal passage for today was Ephesians 6.12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That battle is going, it's an unseen battle going on right now for us. Angels and demons fighting right now that we don't physically see, but it's happening. But I think we obviously see the effects of it right here on this earth. We're going to talk a little bit about some of that stuff. I heard a story, I read a story this morning. There was a boxer in the ring, and he was getting just thumped. The other guy was just beating him bloody. Nose, eyes swollen shut, all that stuff. And every time in between the rounds, he'd come back, and they'd sit in a chair, and they'd give him a little water, and his trainer would say, oh, you're doing good, you're doing good, you're doing good. After about five rounds, he comes back, and he's just barely standing. And, oh, yeah, yeah, you're doing good. He said, well, then do me a favor and watch that referee, because if it ain't the other guy, somebody's beating me up. <laughs> I think sometimes it's easy for us to think that we're not engaged. We're not involved. I can tell you from personal experience, there's nothing glorious about battle or war at all. When it's physical battle, there's nothing good about it. There's absolutely nothing good about it at all. And we see today in our in our world today, we look at Israel, there are times when physically we have to we have to do something about the evil in the world. It does happen. 
And that is a necessary thing. But we also have to realize that the evil that's in the world is not coming from human beings. It's coming from Satan. And those that are doing evil are doing it as conduits of him. He's the one that's acting through them. So while there are physical wars going on, there's also spiritual wars going on. And you're being attacked right now, whether you know it or not. Whether you acknowledge it or not, doesn't matter. You're still in the middle of it. Go ahead, Real. So how do we know that we're in a spiritual battle? How do we know that there is this, this battle going on outside of what we can see? What we can see is only a part. I'm going to bring up a Christmas verse here right off the bat, Luke 2, 13 through 14. And suddenly there was an angel, there with the angel, a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those who is, he is pleased. Every so often, as we go through the Bible, every so often we will see a human that is given a glimpse, has been given a glimpse, that veil is open just for a second, and they can see how much is on the other side. How much is in that realm that we don't see? Daniel, in Daniel's vision, he was, he, there was one time in Daniel where, some, where the angel came to him and he said, nobody saw him but me, but everybody else ran away in terror. They didn't see it, but they felt it, that there was something else. Daniel was given visions of the things that were going on. We're going to have some other ones coming up here in a minute too. Colossians 1, 15 through 16 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Again, it says right there, visible and invisible. The things that are going on right now that are invisible to us still affect us. Now, if you are a believer in Christ, you have entered the war and picked a side. If you are not, if you have not accepted Christ yet, you're still in the middle of the battle. You just haven't picked a side yet. The battle doesn't change. I, I can tell you from experience, I hope that we never get in a situation where the battle, a physical battle, is right in our neighborhood, in our yards, in our, right where we are. That is a terrible, terrible, terrible thing. When Jane and I were in Somalia, there was huge skyscrapers, big multi-story buildings. At one time, they were a very developed nation, and they had all sorts of things going for them. When we were there, I didn't see a piece of glass in a window anywhere in the country. They'd been at war, civil war, for so long, they just blew each other up with tanks. Uh, they had all sorts of things going on, and it knocked them back to probably back 200 years in the way that they functioned. Most of them didn't have electricity or running water anymore. And they went from a, what we would consider a modern society to that. I, I pray that that never, ever happens here. That we never have to see a physical war in our own neighborhood where we are. But that doesn't mean we're not engaged in the spiritual war that's going on. And if you are a believer, you have joined up with God's army. Because if you are with him, you are with him. There's no, there's no unknown about that. There's no question about that. Hebrews 11, 3, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of, out of things that are visible. If you believe in God, there are a lot of things we believe in that we don't see, right? Anybody sitting in here alive now that saw Jesus die for you? Did you see him resurrected? None of those things. And yet in faith we believe that. We believe the things we haven't seen. And the reason we believe is because we go to the Word, and the Word tells us, and the Holy Spirit fills us, and then we understand. That's what comes out of that. We get an understanding of the unseen things. Faith is believing in what you don't see, hoping for what's to come, not knowing what's, what's in front of us. There are two different outlooks on the world. You can have a naturalistic outlook or a spiritual outlook. The naturalistic outlook is the one where it's science. What I see is what's real. What's here is what's real. The problem with science is it can't explain away the things that are unseen. And then there's a spiritual outlook. And a spiritual outlook spends a lot of time on the things that aren't seen. And I think we can have a spiritual outlook, but we have to have a Christian spiritual outlook. Because there's a lot of people out there 
with Ouija boards and all sorts of other junk going on to consider themselves spiritual. But they're not listening to God. They're listening to Satan. That's it, plain and simple. To be spiritual, as a Christian, we believe that we are at war. And we believe that we're being attacked and we have to defend ourselves. 2 Kings uh, 15 through 17. We're talking about Elisha here. And this is one of those times when that window, that veil was lifted for one particular man. Elisha knew it, but he showed it to somebody else. When the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army of horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? He said, do, do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, Lord, please open his eyes so that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Amen. The battle was happening. Don't worry about the stuff happening here in front of us, son, because we got more on the outside. Let me, let me show you what's out there. God revealed to this young man the chariots that were outside of the other chariots. Don't worry about those guys because there's a lot more out there. We have fighting for us an entire army of angels led by Christ. There are other times in the Bible where an angel says, well, I was delayed. I was delayed by the king of Persia, the spirit that's in charge of the king of Persia. And I needed Michael to come and fight for me so I could come to you. Those things are happening. Those are happening right now. Whether we, whether we recognize it or not, it's on us. But that's happening. <clears throat> so what about this spiritual warfare? What's going on? How can it affect us? Well, the first way is obvious. Each of us as individuals are going to be attacked. And I will tell you right now, if you are trying to walk a Christian walk, your, your attacks should be increasing. You should be at war even more intensely because you follow Christ, because now as an identified member, you're wearing a uniform and they shoot at the uniform. If you are following Christ, you should be getting attacked. And if you're aware of that, you should be defending yourself. But when we look at things like your personal life, there's all sorts of things, ways that Satan can attack you. Satan can attack you with guilt. Satan can attack you with distraction. Satan can attack you with anger. Ephesians 4, 25-27. Paul says, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Again, Satan can't take away the salvation that God gave you. However, if you let him into your life, if you allow him to get in, the, if you open a door for Satan to come into your life, he will attack you mercilessly. And he will steal your witness. And he will steal the goodness and the, the abundant life that God promised us. Right here, right now, we can have an abundant life with Christ. But if we spend all our time with Satan sitting on one shoulder, we're not going to get that abundance. We're not going to live the life we should be living. We, we will not be able to do what we should be able to do because we're letting Satan get into your head. Every single day, we are attacked in every possible way you can imagine. And the biggest way is going to be through your mind. It's going to come in through your eyes. It's going to come in through your ears. It's going to come in through your emotions. And when it gets there and it settles in, it's just going to burn. We have to combat, our, combat against that. Look at what the world puts in front of us right now. We were listening to a sermon on the way in today about how we are created in God's own image. Well, what's the world tell you? You're not young enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not strong enough. You're not skinny enough. You're not fill in the blank. All those things are personal attacks on you. And if you're dealing with that attack, if you're dealing with that self-doubt, if you're dealing with the fact that you don't feel that you are sufficient. That's Satan talking to you. That ain't God. God created you in his own image. Enough said. Anytime you feel like you're not enough, that's not God speaking to you. Anytime that you feel like you're failing, 
Listen closely. Because God can tell you, hey, you're screwing up, come back. But Satan will tell you, hey, you're screwing up, you're not worth it anymore. You're not good enough. You're not following Jesus close enough. That's the personal attacks that can happen in our lives. 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. <coughs> Excuse me, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Satan's after all of us. Realize the fact that if Satan is attacking you, it's not a new thing on earth. Everybody gets those attacks. Everybody has that happening to them. Everybody who's a Christian is being attacked. Your brothers and sisters who look like they're doing it right are still being attacked. The ones that are struggling and falling down, it's because they're being attacked. We need to recognize that, but we also need to say, it says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Watch for those attacks. Grab those thoughts captive and say, hey, I know that's not from God. What did Jesus say to Peter when Peter said, oh, that's not going to happen to you? Let's just, let's just pretend this isn't going to happen. He said, get behind me, Satan. Yeah. Get out. Because the same man who said something positive said something negative. Grab hold of that thought and say, hey, I know who's talking to me right now, and I'm not listening to you. Get out. When you do, when you close the door, he can't come in. Satan comes in when we open the door to let him in. You are redeemed by Jesus Christ. Satan is not more powerful than that. Jesus conquered death. Jesus conquered Satan. There is no way that there are any powers that he has that can overcome Christ. But we as his followers are going to be in the battle every day. And being in the battle means that we're going to be attacked. And if we're not guarding ourselves, if we're not filling ourselves with Christ, if we have an empty spot that Satan can crawl into and, and nestle down and find a home, he's going to do that. We have to be constantly aware that attacks are common. Romans 7, 15 through 20, for I do not understand my own actions. This is Paul talking, and he says, I, I don't do it right sometimes. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law, that is good. So now it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Paul struggled with the same thing that all humans do from the beginning of time, from, from the original sin of Adam. Sin has come into the world, and sin is in each one of us. And I hate to say this, because it might be uncomfortable, but if you've accepted Christ, there's still sin in your life. It's still possible. Okay? No one is without sin. We fight that, though. That's the difference between a follower of Christ and a follower of the world. Sin is something we fight against. We don't revel in. We don't enjoy sin. We recognize it for what it is and try and get rid of it. That's part of that spiritual battle. Our human nature is very base. Our human nature is one of those things where we say, I want this and I don't care what it takes to get it. I don't want anybody to know what I'm doing. It's a secret just between me and me. I don't want to show it to anyone. That's part of our human nature. And Satan loves to take that human nature and make it who we are. That's not who we are called to be. As children of God, we're called to be better than that. And I have heard many, many parents talking to their children when they do something wrong and saying, I know you're better than that. Our Father in Heaven says the same thing. I know you're better than that. Get rid of that stuff because I know you're better than that. Another place we can be attacked is in our family life. I didn't even bother to put any verses up about family life because we, I could spend a whole sermon just on this one slide. Think of all the ways we're being attacked right now. Is there any question whatsoever that the family, the family unit, is being attacked? The very first family was attacked by Satan, Adam and Eve. You think he's going to stop after that? 
Was he kind of successful there? Yeah, he brought sin in. He cracked that open. He's going to continue to attack the family because that is the first unit that was put together by God, man and woman put together by God for a purpose. It's not good for man to be alone. He needs someone with him. He created man and woman for that purpose. And we look at what's going on in the world right now. Well, according to the world, we can redefine what marriage is. We can make it out to be whatever we want it to be. No, God said a man and a woman. One of each. He didn't say anything else about any other marriage that's out there. Anytime someone wants to take marriage, which is a Christian ideal, and turn it into anything else, they're trying to pollute and distort and twist what God meant to happen. We've gotten to the point where we actually redefine what a man and a woman is. We don't even know anymore. When you look at the world, nobody knows. A Supreme Court justice, a woman, was asked, can you define what a woman is? And she said, I can't do that. You're supposed to be one of the smartest people in our country. You want the job. You are a woman, and you can't say what a woman is. How did we get so far in our world, in our culture, that we can say, I don't even know what a woman is? How can a woman not say what a woman is? I can tell you what a man is. I can also tell you what a woman is because the biblical definition is, is pretty clear. It's pretty simple. Why do we have to have 28 different genders? Yeah, that's what I heard lately. It's up to 28 different possibilities. What? How crazy is that? And yet, the world is telling us that these things are normal. And that if we don't accept it, then we're intolerant. Satan is saying, let's just muddy the water up so much that there's no that there's no truth anymore. Let's just confuse it all. Let's get it all so murky that nobody knows what's real. The sanctity of life. How in the world can anyone ever say that a child is not worth it? That a baby is not worth it? That an elder is not worth it? That anyone is worth more or less? That someone does not... Have Every person in this country is endowed with the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's the first thing we wrote down, and everybody likes to quote that. But everybody that wants to go pro-choice on things says, I choose not to have somebody else have life. When did we get to the point where we can harden our hearts so much that children can be killed and people think it's, it's a safe thing, it's a good thing? We call it health care. How twisted have we become? That what God intended, a man and a woman raising children, has gotten to that point. That it's so twisted up that it doesn't even make sense anymore. People don't recognize it for what it is. Number three, oh, Satan's going to attack the church. Satan really hates communal worship. Because just like if you're in a battlefield, if you're by yourself, you're an easy target. The more you are gathered around with people that are like-minded, that are on the same mission as you, that are on, on the same page as you, that are in the Word with you, the more time you spend in community with other Christians, the more dangerous you are to Him. Satan does not want to see us together. He loves it when we can throw something up and say, you know what, I'm too busy. I've got too much going on. Not right now. You know, I don't like that person sitting on the other side. It's one time somebody said something, one time. So I'm never going back to that church. Well, I'm a Christian, but I won't extend grace. I only want to accept grace. Satan loved to put that stuff in us too. I told you once about a, a church that Buck Hill told me about that actually split. The church broke. People left. Half of the church left. You know why? Because during baptism, some of them said you should go face first in the water, and some of them said you should go backwards into the water. And a church split. What would God think about that? God would say, jump head first in the tank. I don't care. Be baptized. Why are we, why are we nitpicking over rules? 
Why are we separating ourselves? And I think Satan is, is behind that because he's starting to put things in to stumble over and to break. And I think we are at real danger right now here, especially in the United States, of having people come in and do that. People that are acting as false prophets, that are bringing things forward that are not true, and putting them forth as truth from a pulpit on a Sunday morning, and people are listening to a false prophet and saying, that must be real then. If you ever question what I'm saying up here, please go into the Bible and look it up. And if I'm wrong, confront me and tell me. If you don't know why I'm saying something that I'm saying, come and ask me. But it's going to be very easy, and it says in the later days, it's going to become more and more common that we have false prophets. 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3. Paul says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons, through the insincerity of liars, whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Paul was dealing in these churches a lot of times with, with the food issue. He was dealing with, with uh, circumcision. He was dealing with all this kind of stuff. But in this particular passage, he says, Beware, because in the later times... People will be devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. I don't want to ever hate anyone. As a human being, I don't want to hate other human beings. As a child of God, I don't hate other human beings. Sometimes i got to fight that urge. But there are things that are being said and are being taught that are hateful, in my opinion. Things that are being said and being taught that are coming straight from Satan, and there's no way we can categorize it any other way and if that's what's being taught that is demonic that is that spiritual warfare coming to the surface because someone who has been given the opportunity to get a microphone or a typewriter or no typewriters anymore sorry a computer a keyboard they've had the ability to get themselves to the point where someone is listening to them and when someone listens to them, if they are being controlled by demonic forces, that is being spread then. We all have heard and we all know of evangelists and leaders who started a great ministry. And then somewhere along the line, Satan got inside. And they fell hard. And you know what? There were fragile people on the other end of that equation that were watching that were broken by that. We have to be careful about what we see and what we hear and what we believe. <coughs> know for a fact what you believe. There's one group in the Bible that are mentioned called the Bereans. And one of the things they did, they listened to everything that was said by Paul, and then they went and checked it and made sure it matched up with Scripture. That's the way we're supposed to do it. 2 Corinthians 11, 14. For such men are false prophets, deceitful workmen disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. We have this strange image. We're coming up on Halloween here. In the Middle Ages, for the very first time, somebody put in a painting that the devil was red and he had a tail. If he shows up looking like that in the back of the room, we'll all recognize him, right? It'd be easy to recognize him if Satan was only bound to look like a Halloween character. That's not what he looks like. He looks like whatever he wants to look like. And if he wants to get your approval, he's going to take an appearance that is approved. He's going to look like an angel. And we know in the last times we look in Revelation, people are, are, are led by a false prophet. And they're led by a false prophet, and the Antichrist comes out, and he is charismatic. And he has all the answers, and he can solve all your problems. He looks good, he sounds good, he smells good, he tastes good. Everything's perfect. That's Satan. So don't be deceived just by the outward appearance. Don't be deceived by the track record somebody has. Don't be deceived about what they've done in the past. Every word that comes out of someone's mouth has to be coming from God, or they're not speaking from God. Every time. Beware of that. Well, and the number four. The other place that Satan loves to attack us is in our culture and in our nation. It's here right now. Everybody in here, I'm sure, is aware, to some extent or the other, about what happened in Israel. Terrorists attacked and killed men, women, and children. 
in horrific ways. Absolutely horrific ways. They did it in the middle of the night. They burned houses down with people in, in them. They did all sorts of atrocities that I don't even want to talk about. And yet we have people in this country who say that it's their fault, not the terrorist's fault. It's the victim's fault. They did it to themselves because they, they weren't nice to these other people, so it's okay that they came in and killed them. We have members in the U.S. Congress, members in the U.S. Congress, who are saying things like that. That's not coming from God. We have a great influence over the world. The United States always has. There's a reason people are coming across our southern border and trying to get into our country, because they, they know that it's a benefit to be here. People want to come here still. That tells you something. Not a whole lot of people running into China. Not a whole lot of people running and, and sneaking across the border into North Korea. Not a whole lot of people running and sneaking across the border into Saudi Arabia or Iran to try and find a better life. We have been blessed by God in this country. I have no doubt about that whatsoever. We have been blessed by God. But in return for that blessing, we need to be living the life that our country was meant to live. We look at our founding fathers, and I don't care what any college professor says, when you look at the writings of the founding fathers, they built this country on Christianity. They built the Constitution on Christianity. They mention God in the Declaration of Independence. God-given rights. It's a new thing. It's a strange thing, but it was based on Christianity. It was based on Jesus. And we have taken it so far that we have got a warning this morning. I saw on Fox News from the head of the FBI. Watch out for terrorist attacks in the United States now. Because that mentality is so common in our country now. The anti-Semitism and the hate is so common in our country that somebody else is going to say, well, that looks like a good idea. Let's go attack people too. In our country. And we have gotten to that point where we tolerate the mentality and the mouth and the words so much. All the hatred and all that stuff, we tolerate that so much. How can we expect anything other than a physical manifestation of that? When Satan attacks in the spiritual realm, we get to see the scars and the wounds and the ugliness in the physical realm around us. And that's ugly. That's, that's a, direct relation, a, a direct result of Satan being allowed into, into a human's life. And our culture is getting so twisted because we're letting Satan in. We're letting him come at us. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The world is going to give, be given over to Satan. It is, he, is, he is the Lord of this world. So if you're conforming with the world that he creates, you're on his side. If you don't conform to what he creates, okay, but it doesn't say don't be conformed, just leave it there. It says be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's not enough to be neutral. You can't be Switzerland. Jesus said you're either for me or against me, period. End of story. There's no, there's no gray area. There's a line and you're either on this side or that side. The time's going to come in Revelation. They open the book of life and he's going to say you stand on the left and you stand on the right, period. End of story. You can't say, well, I kind of walk the middle. <laughs> yeah, then get on the left. There is no middle ground. There is no spectator in a gunfight. It just doesn't happen. Go ahead. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And you were dead in trespass and sin in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were... And we're by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Until you let Christ into your heart, until he takes you over, until you surrender to him, you're of the world. That's it. That's the options. And the world's controlled by Satan. So you have that choice. 
Jesus lays it out very simply. Either you're for me or you're against me. If you accept the free gift of grace that God gives you, you are then saved. Why do we say saved? Because the alternative is being lost. Lost to the world. Lost to the things that are, that are put out there that are attacking us. Lost to accepting the things that the world has to say, however crazy it is, and say, well, I guess somebody said so, so it must be right. Last night, I got to tell you this. I got to say this. <clears throat> Our grandson got from a, from Beth, our friend, she gave him a karaoke machine for his birthday. Christmas. For his birthday. Oh, yeah, for his birthday. Sorry. Christmas is coming. <laughs> well, yeah. For his birthday, she gave him a karaoke machine, and it plays CDs. And he loves Johnny Cash. And there's a song about chicken lights and chrome. He loves that one. And he gets under it because he did a bass voice. It's, it's fun, and my granddaughter's dancing. So James, and, and he's kind of into trucks right now, so Jane went online and bought a trucker CD <laughs> from eBay and didn't look at the name of the songs. There's some very odd ones on there. And my, last night our daughter called up and said, hey, you want to hear the music you just sent your grandson? She put that on there. And Jane's like, oh boy, throw that one away. And I said, well, I'll find And I found a four CD collection with Red Sovine on there. Phantom 309, oh my golly, Convoy, kid needs to learn those if he's a trucker. But then we also got him Ray Stevens' greatest hits too, so. Awesome. So last night we were watching some of the Ray Stevens ones on YouTube just, just because it was funny. We remember those things from being a kid, watching Street, there's things like that. And a thing, and a video pops up on YouTube saying that Toby Keith died last night. <laughs> he didn't. He didn't die last night. But there's big, big obituaries for people that are alive and well. But I guarantee you, my young people in the room, I'm going to ask you, Zoe, you're my oldest young person. When was the last time you looked at a news site? Actually, intentionally went to a news site to read the news. Oh, pretty, pretty frequently. Oh! All right. Okay. Good job. What's the source of the news you get on your app, on your phone? Where does the news come from? The news app on my phone. Yeah, but what, who writes it? What's the source of that news? All the news that you see on the TV. Highlights come up, stuff like that. Yeah. And that happens. Everybody gets something like that. Do we know that it's true when it's said? Do we know the source of those things? That's one of the things that's really polluting our society is we have so much access to so much social media. Pick up a phone, at the, uh, open up your phone, and you can see everything that's going on in the world according to somebody who put it on the internet. Somebody types it up and puts it on there. Whether it's right or wrong, somebody put it in there. Whether it's true or not, somebody put it in there. We have to be discerning about it. We have to look at things and say, you know, that doesn't sound right. Maybe I'll research that a little bit before I think this is... What is gospel? The word itself means the word of God. The word of God. So before you think something, something's true, compare it with the word and see if that's reality. We have to remember in this battle that we're not alone. While we are fighting this spiritual warfare, we are not alone. Don't be overwhelmed. First of all, we know who wins in the end. Secondly, if we stand firm, we know what the result is in the end. We know what's going to happen in the end. This passage from John 17 that I put up here. Jesus is praying before his crucifixion. And he's praying for his disciples and he's praying for anybody who follows him. And he says these things to God. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them. And not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. 
They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Jesus is praying to God. He said, protect them. I don't want you to take every, every good one out. I don't want you to reach down and scoop up everybody who's righteous. I want you to leave them there because of the influence we can have. But Father, just protect them as I leave. Can you imagine the agony Jesus went through? He's been followed around by these people for three years. And nothing bad has happened to any of them while he's with them. And he has given them the word. And now he's leaving. Father, keep your hand on him when I'm not there to do it. Protect them. That's us. Not just the disciples, but those that followed on. That is all of us. God is with us. And if God is with us, who can be against us? Who can beat us? Nobody. As long as we stick close to the Father. All right. Application time. There's just a couple of them I'm going to put in here. First of all, you need to be fighting. You need to be willing to fight. You need to understand that you need to fight. And you need to understand you're being attacked. You cannot stand by and say, this isn't happening to me. I'm just watching the rest of you. It's not how it works. You're being attacked and you need to fight back. James 4, 7, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Submit yourself to God. If you feel yourself full of God, there's no room for Satan to get in there. 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5, for though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not, the, not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. The last one I'm going to put up here. This week, Friday, I was at uh, Windswept. I substitute taught at Windswept, which is always fun because no matter which class I'm teaching, I get to teach the Bible class. I love that. And the woman that I was filling in for said, you know, they, they have a, t a review on these things that they've been studying and things like that, but you do a devotional, whatever, lady, whatever God lays on, you aren't going to do it. We did this, this out of Ephesians 6. This is the armor of God. This is the full armor of God. And why does Paul tell us to put armor on? Because we're not, he just said in the last passage that we're not fighting a war of flesh. So if we're not fighting a war of flesh, why do we need armor? That's what armor is for. If you've ever worn armor, I can tell you, when we were in Somalia, everybody had to wear body armor. But the body armor we had was just absolute junk. Most people use it for a pillow. It was that soft. I can't imagine it stopping anything. But you would see, I would see my wife before she was my wife in her little gray shorts and her gray PT shirt and her flip-flops and her helmet and her body armor going to take a shower. Shorts, flip-flops, and body armor. Well, that'll work. You know, we get hit by a bomb, you'll be good. Just wear that vest. I went out after, after uh, there was a, a vehicle that got hit, a bunch of guys got killed. Next day, my team and I went out. And the Army, realizing that we didn't have the best body armor, gave us what was some German body armor to go out with. They call it chicken armor. It's solid plate. And it comes below your waist. And we were driving vehicles. It was like wearing a barrel. And it was 112 <laughs> degrees that day. We're driving around, and trust me, if you are in a battle zone and you don't have to wear armor, you take it off. There's nothing comfortable or fun or great. It's not like costume. It's miserable to be wearing that stuff. If you don't have to, you don't wear it. So why does Paul tell us to wear it when we're not in a battle of flesh? Well, he's not talking about physical armor. He's talking about spiritual armor. And that armor, we've all heard it before, but I'm going to do it again. The belt of truth. Okay? The breastplate of righteousness. Uh, readiness given the gospel of peace for your feet. The shield of faith, which can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. There you go, right there. That attack from Satan, those temptations, the possibility of opening that door, the knock on that door from Satan, that you can open up that door, that's the fiery darts. He's not talking about a cannibal, he's talking about little things, and Satan loves the little things. Pick at you with the little things. 
The big things we can say, well, that's obvious. That's, I know that's wrong. That's on a billboard. It's, it's lit up with neon. It's not, it's not how Satan's going to operate. Satan's going to operate by doing the little things. So those little fiery darts coming at you. And without the shield of faith, you're going to have to take it. And it's going to hurt. And it's going to cause you not to have the life God wants you to have. We are all going to suffer on this earth. We are all going to be in for hard times. We don't need to make it worse by letting Satan take over. And then I want to tell, I want to bring one last thing up. 17. The helmet of salvation, which covers everything, top down. Put your head in the helmet. If you can block Satan out of your thoughts by the salvation that you have received from Christ, if you recognize the gift that you've been given and you act like you've been given that gift and put that helmet on, that's one thing. And the other thing, of course, the sword of the Spirit. The one thing that not only can you defend yourself with, but you can attack Satan with. When Jesus was in the desert, in Matthew 4, and Satan was tempting him, he didn't say, because I'm Jesus, get away. He said, the word of God says, it is written. And he quoted scripture to him. Now anybody can quote scripture. But Jesus used this as his sword to defend himself against Satan. And I think maybe we ought to be doing the same thing. So for an application of that, you better get familiar with your armor and you better get familiar with your weapon. Because the word of God is the only offensive weapon we have. We need to use that in our fight, in our battle. Wouldn't it be nice to have something to fight back if you get backed into a corner? If Satan gets you in a spot where you're, you feel like you're getting overwhelmed, you can curl up in a corner in your armor all you want and just let him beat on you. It would be a miserable life. Wouldn't it be nice to fight back? We're called to fight. Not to defend, but to fight. We need to fight these things in this spiritual realm. That's spiritual work. And that's our role in it. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for the word that you've given us here, Lord. I thank you for your word, for our sword. The word of God, the sword that we have that defines things, that can separate, the sharp two-edged sword that separates bone from sinew. Lord, the sword that you have given us is complete and enough. If we remember to draw it and use it. If we remember to sharpen our minds and our knowledge. Lord, help us to get into your word. Help us, help us to let the Holy Spirit overwhelm us with knowledge of your word. Help us, Lord, to fill ourselves so full of you and so full of the Spirit that there's no room for Satan. And in those times and in those instances where he gets a crack in the door, Lord, help us to grab a hold of him and say, get out. This is not your home and you're not welcome here. I am a son of God. I am a child of God. I am a daughter of God. Help us, Father, in this battle that we are in. We lean on your strength. We lean on your provision. And we lean on your word for all that you do in this, in this lifetime. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.